Now let me move from physics to uh, neuroscience. I want to explain why we can uh, now make a convincing case against the common belief that the human mind is associated with an immaterial, immortal soul. If consciousness is to continue after death, uh, then how can we become unconscious by brain injury, chemicals, illness, or anesthesia, which are purely material in nature? Brain scans are incredibly, uh, of incredible precision, no, make enable neuro neurosciences scientists to locate places in the brain where various thoughts and emotions arise. Uh, models for how the brain produces consciousness are now sufficiently developed uh, that they're be, beginning to be tested in the laboratory. Now, we still don't have uh, a complete model of consciousness, but uh, we're getting there. Now, the brain model of, uh, of mind, the material model of mind, allows, allows for free will. Uh, decisions are made mainly by the, by the unconscious computer-like algorithms operating in our brain. We, you know, that's where the decisions are made, without our knowledge of, of our awareness of them. That's where, uh, so these algorithms operate on data that come from an, uh, an individual's full experience. The same algorithms may exist in another brain, but lead to a different decision because of the different input data. So our decisions are unique to us individually, and since there's no one else controlling our brains, including God, those decisions are free, so we have free will. Finally, let me address claims that we read about all the time, that scientific evidence exists for life after death. Uh, some of this comes from uh, the long history of studies on paranormal uh, phenomena such as ghosts and mediums uh, communicating with the dead. However, again, in 150 years of such studies, there's a single claim that's been verified using the same criteria that you would apply to any new scientific discovery. Now, most attention in, in recent years has been addressed to the so-called near-death experiences. People resuscitated after being near-dead or even clinically dead uh, with flat EEGs, report experiences that they interpret as a glimpse of heaven moving uh, down a tunnel of light, uh, uh, feeling warmth, ser ser serenity, and sometimes fear, but mostly feeling pretty good. Uh, and um, this is again a quite com common phenomenon. <laughs> there was a new book that brief briefly made the New York Times bestseller list a week ago, I noticed it wasn't on there this week, uh, called The Evidence for Life After Death, where, where uh, some physicians used the internet to gather 1,600 uh, anecdotal stories uh, of absolutely no scientific value. <laughs> you could, you could, do, you could uh, do an internet survey and get 1,600 stories on anything you want, I'm sure. Just, just pose the question and then they will come. <laughs> now these experiences, these near-death experiences, are convincing to subjects who often change their lives and become more religious and, and, and really convinced of an air crisis. No doubt the experience exists, okay, I'm not doing that. Uh, there, there's little, little doubt that it's a real experience. Now they're variable, they depend on culture, and they actually don't occur in, in most cases. They only about 20% of, of, of uh, resuscitations report a near-death experience. Now, this has been uh, studied now for about 30 years. Researchers have their own journal, the Journal of Near-Death Studies. Now, most of the researchers are physicians and nurses working in hospitals, uh, not PhDs trained in, in proper research techniques. They're believers. But nevertheless, they, from what I read, they, uh, they impressed me as being honest and well-intentioned. So there, with that particular group, the group that, that's doing the serious research, uh, a, uh, at least I don't accuse them of, of being dishonest. Now, a few studies are, uh, are well-controlled, however. Uh, most reports are anecdotal. And there's lots of bogus claims in the, in the 
popular literature. You really have to make a distinction here between the popular literature, there's a hundred books out there with titles on them, such as Evidence for Life After Death, uh, that talk about near-death experiences anecdotally, and uh, uh, they're just uh, stories. There's, there's no scientific merit in most of them. But let me give you an example of the sort of thing you will read in the popular literature that the, that the legitimate researchers don't fall for. Uh, there's a story where uh, some woman was on, on the operating table and she imagined floating above her body. This is a common part of an near death experience, it's a so called out of, out of body experience where you float up above the table. And incidentally, it's something very easily tested. They could put some numbers up on the, uh, on the ceiling and see if uh, the person could read them. No one's ever been able to do that. Uh, but she floated out the window of the hospital and she saw on the ledge an old shoe. And she came back to life and she reported this shoe. And how could she have known about that shoe? And, and uh, this is all written up uh, in, the, in the popular books. Well, some skeptics finally got around to checking it out. And they went in and they found that uh, if you went through the, as soon as you opened the door to her room, you could see the shoe sitting out there on the ledge. And, uh, that, 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 you know, you see, you have people like that who are, who are trying to promote something, who are obviously doing it to sell books, uh, and not uh, uh, serious work. But uh, there has been a lot of good serious work done, and the people who, uh, in the field will recognize, they, they say that, uh, uh, they will tell you uh, that this, there hasn't been a case of uh, a verifiable uh, near-death experience, such as I talked about, where you you read some numbers that uh, uh, the person couldn't have, have uh, known. In fact, there's a, a famous case uh, that goes back many, many years of Charles Tart, who's a famous uh, he, uh, psychic researcher, and he uh, he had placed some numbers on, on a woman's chest, and she had floated up above herself during her out-of-body experience and had read the numbers. And it took about 10 years for skeptics to discover what had happened. Somebody finally went in there and they saw that there was this clock on the wall and the reflection, uh, in the reflection of the clock, she could read the, you know, she the woman obviously could have read the numbers. So, so many, so many uh, problems associated with this kind of research.